Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight on Coracle Live, Books, Bards, and Ballads. I'm Morgan with the Sisterhood of Avalon and the chairperson of the Coracle. So tonight, we were going to be chatting with Justine Journey. I got to be honest with you, Justine fascinates me. Um, she lives in the forests of Pennsylvania. As you can see, she's sitting outside in the dark. She has several degrees. She walks an Avalonian path, and she also walks an indigenous path. Um, she's had a career in midwifery and parenting education. She's facilitated coming of age retreats for young girls and uh, has co-hosted Rediscovering the Feminine Mysteries workshops on women's sexual health and pleasure. I know she works with her would you call it your company, Justine, Quantum Cauldron? Sure. Yeah, let's call it that. <laughs> okay. Uh, astrology and uh, tarot. And um, she makes jewelry and artwork and is currently writing a book to dance in Stargazer Meadow, reflections on existential gratitude and chronic illness, and hoping to get her interactive children's book about working with the lunar cycles let the moon guide you out into the world as well. So, Justine, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Oh, and oh, thank, thank you. you. Your sister, Justine, is also the secretary on the board of trustees. Of I'm the, the, the brand new shiny secretary. Brand new. Just, brand new. just learning, just learning the ropes. Um, and um, yeah, it was a real... Um, you know, a call to service, really. And it was not something that was on my radar. Um, and, I, you know, I, I'd come onto the aisle every day and I'd see that announcement, like, we're still looking for a secretary. And I'd be like, gosh, I really hope they find one and just scroll on past. And, um, you know, it. another one of the Council of Nine reached out to me and, um, uh, you know, on a separate matter and sort of like nudge, 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 like we're still taking applications for that. Um, and so it was, it was really timely um, for people who are in the sisterhood. Um, and they'll already know one of the wonderful options that we have is to undergo um, our quest during our, our time on the aisle and um, I was fresh off the barge and just leapt right in. I signed up for all three, like, you know, as soon as like the very first day they'd let me, I was there. And so my first three years with the sisterhood were really focused on selfishly wanting to take care of myself and to find where I was fitting in and where my call to the goddess was, and um, I promised myself when I got there, I'm going to be, I want to start out as the most ignorant of the sisters that has ever been. I, I'm not going to read a single one of the books. I'm not going to look ahead in any of the work. I'm going to wait until it is presented to me and then really feel that gut experience of what happens if I just let myself absorb this and I'm not constantly trying to be the most competent person in my particular zip code. You know, I don't always have to be that student and we all remember them from school if we weren't them we definitely remember them <laughs> you know raising our hand frantically like I know the answer I've got it I've got it what would happen to my self-worth and my value and my feelings of worthiness if I was the last person to answer or if I just said I don't know the answer like what kind of growth process could I encounter if I accepted that about myself. And of course that meant facing anxiety and, you know, unknown, you know, the unknowns of things, because part of anybody who has anxiety, we all know that 
one of the surest ways to try to make ourselves feel better. It doesn't always work, but if we're fully informed, if we fully know everything, then maybe we can get ahead of things. We can be the first one to raise our hand. Um, so I was really confronting all of that shadow work at the same time. Like, what happens if I don't know answers? What does that say about me? And um, what what do I still want to learn and to pursue? And And honestly, I could not have done it in a more perfect way for myself. I'm so glad that I listened to myself because... It was serendipitous as soon as, you know, the, the quests were just rolling out of the way. And then this call to service and leadership presented itself. And it was like, you know, for all of my like, well, what what if I don't know things? What if, And it's like it fit perfect into that. And of course, I think that's one of the wonderful things about our leadership and all of the sisters who are on the board and on the Council of Nine, we're just people, <laughs> you know, like doing doing what people do. And we're all able to lean on each other and interact with each other in ways that further ourselves and each other simultaneously. And it's just it's such a wonderful model of how I think so many things could be out in the world and in our own communities and our families. Um, so it's so much bigger than just, you know, what, what, what we're learning or what we're saying or, or things like that. We build these incredible friendships and sisterhoods together and, um, this is a shameless plug, everyone. So <laughs> the portal is open. The portal is open. Um, so if if you've been wanting to do this, um, please, please, please join us. It's um, I know that you're busy. I know that your calendar is packed. I know that you can't fathom taking on one more thing in your world. Joining the sisterhood didn't erase my mundane responsibilities and and things, but what it did do was allow me to prioritize them in a way that became sacred. You know, I didn't become less busy, but I was able to figure out what I wanted to be busy doing. So it's not that we make room for the sisterhood, right? I think the sisterhood teaches us how to make room for everything in, in a much different way. I think it enhances everything right. as well that we do. Um, I was just speaking for myself. It's like, I go to the sisterhood, but I take the sisterhood with me everywhere I go, you know? And uh, every once in a while when I say, oh, I, I don't know if, you know, and my altars are packed and this and this and this. And a certain friend on the council will say, the altar is inside you. So <laughs> just carry it with us. And uh, right. yeah, it goes everywhere with you. It enhances everything that you do. Um, so we've touched on Avalon and um, what we love about it. So but before we go and talk about anything else, I would like to um, have you tell us about um your indigenous path sure um well i wasn't raised indigenous um and that's you know quite the story in itself um i was around 16 when this was revealed to us um to my brother and i and um it really fit into um a, a pretty long standing narrative that both of us had where we would, we knew something was hidden. We knew that something wasn't being revealed to us. And we created entire fantasy worlds built around 
that you know we were we were the secret son and daughter of you know some foreign king and queen and we were being raised as mere you know civilians so that we could remain humble and you know and really like get to rule the country one day um you know with with all the humility and you know like yes. all, all these kind of fantasy stories about you know being rescued about being um having uh, having this big secret revealed where our purpose would be announced and and like we'd step through into a new life and it was obviously way less dramatic than any of that but it really confirmed our suspicions right that there was something and um it was such a testament to our innate wisdom about ourselves and our experience and the the drumbeat of how our cellular wisdom knows more than our intellectual selves. And um, so it, it wasn't um, for another, you know, um, 10 years or so before I even began to look into any of that or um, before my, my dad even had, was looking into it. Um, this was sort of, you know, he he had been in residential schools as a young child. Um, so this was something that was really um, ingrained in people of his generation. You just simply didn't talk about it. You were at risk simply acknowledging it. Um, and <clears throat> until I was, oh, I don't know, five or six years old, it would have been illegal to own any of the sacred items that that we have or even books or a spiritual text or to sing the songs or to do any of the things that um we we might have done to connect with that heritage so um you know it was it was years later in, in my early 20s when um i first started you know, like, okay, well, what would it mean to, you know, learn some of the language or to um, get involved? And, you know, life gets in the way as life does. And I wasn't, I, I, I didn't really do a whole lot with that. My brother and my dad did a lot more with it. And I was off busy um, earning, you know, pieces of paper from colleges and, and um, raising my family and whatnot. And, um, so it was really the you know moving to this piece of land um, that, that you I live on now, where you're living. Yeah, okay. but um, you know I've been here. Um, it, it'll be ten years um, soon, and it was really this notion of like, wow, wait a minute, our Haudenosaunee ancestresses lived on this land before they were driven out of the state of Pennsylvania. And that just really, there was, and, and I, I think this ties in so perfectly with the Avalonian journey as well, right? Because our connection with the story of the land is so vital. These landmarks, these trees, the, the herbs that grow, the, the patterns of, uh, you know, pathways that go through the woods that animals make or you know the the animals themselves these all inform our cells and our story and orient us to something so much more older and more ancient than ourselves and um so yeah the the, the past 10 years i've been on um you know, the, the path to learning um, the language, the Onondawaga Guinyo, um of the Haudenosaunee. And it's, um, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. There's a lot of barriers to, to learning. Um, and ultimately I am not, I was not raised in the culture. I do not have the cultural heritage I benefit so much from my European 
white passing background and history, um, all of the things that were afforded to me um, because of um, the fact that we we weren't being um, raised with prejudices and and bigotry. I mean, there was, but it was we weren't sure why. We weren't sure what was, you know, what was at the heart of that, our, our differences in the way our bodies were or the differences in our skin tones or, um, you know, things like that. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, we grew up with all of the privileges that many lifelong, you know, like people who are born and raised into indigenous culture face much more, um, you know, social and political and uh, religious challenges that I, my brother and I just never had to face. So um, I don't claim to be, you know, like I'm not going to be the person applying for an Indigenous scholarship. I'm not going to be the person, you know, because I can, I can access so those things like everybody else can. I don't need to, um, I'm never trying to get something out of this. I'm the only thing I'm trying to get out of it is a sense of honoring that my cells knew there was more to the story and, um, and that I deserve to know what those stories are and how much of that can I bring into my daily practices and my daily life living on a piece of land, taking care of animals and my family. And, um, you know, like right now we've, um, we've just started raising rabbits and um, we are 10 days into our very first litter of baby bunnies. And, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm going out at all hours to make sure baby bunnies are happy and healthy and safe. And, um, I'm picking herbs and I'm drying herbs and I'm putting up all the the plants that the bunnies like to eat so that we have them over the winter. And, you know, along the way, connecting with the plants, the seasons, uh, you know, all the, all the stuff that's happening. And it's, it's such a, a feeling of safety and security um, that, comes over me when when I'm able to do this when I'm feeling like I'm flowing with the rhythms of the seasons and the land and it's such a hallmark of of what we also do in Avalon you know in in the sisterhood so um you know it's I I know I mention this all the time but it's one of my favorite facts that the land here and the land there used to be, you know, connected. They used to be part of Pangea. And so like this landscape, these plants, this these rocks, they're kind of the same rocks and plants. And um, there's so many parallels um, to like the way that we use herbs. You know, we, we use the same herbs and plants and plant medicines and, and plant allies here that we do, um, you know, over in Wales and Scotland. And um, so I just feel like I'm doing, doing myself such a favor of integration. Like these two halves of me get to just be best friends and there's no better feeling than being my own best friend. I love it. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's wonderful. And I love the way that you're connecting and I know you homeschool your children. <laughs> well, only only well, because that, probably that, the, the yeah. schools would never want them. <laughs> but that kind of They're pretty feral. Of, you know, connecting with the land and living on the land and you know, growing your food and your herbs, mm -hmm. plants that you're using and raising animals and just connecting. I think the homeschooling, the kids now, I mean, so we have that you were in parenting education. So is that, was that the impetus of, of getting you into homeschooling your own children or? Um, I think, I mean, I, I have 
two older children from my first marriage and um they my my first one went all the way through the public school system and my second one we um we began we began homeschooling her when um it became clear that she just wasn't doing <laughs> she wasn't doing all that great in in public school for many reasons but the real um catalyst for it was our um now 20 year old daughter um she was all I can say is she wasn't school material. <laughs> you know, there was no way that she was going to be able to integrate into that world without enormous parts of her being trampled on. And it was really interesting to see that it had also been my brother's journey. Um, the parallels between them were so similar. And um, while he was a lovely human being, there was just something so profoundly, it just couldn't work. School and him just didn't work. Something about him and something about our daughter too um, would just irritate other grown people to to be quite cruel honestly and he experienced so much cruelty from the adults in his world as a child and we we had our daughter in it was actually like a montessori program so it was really upsetting to see how profoundly disapproving they were of her vocally and um so, I mean, we had to yank her out of, you know, Montessori. They were literally, they were like, I don't think she's Montessori material. Uh, but, um, and then, so it was like, you know, I bet there's something else we could do. And, and we, we left into homeschooling, not knowing what it was going to be like or what to expect. And, you know, you get the, the pushback that you always get when you're, you're leaving the systems, um, you know, our families were like, what are you doing? This is madness. Like what happens when they need to know trigonometry and, um, and whatnot. But, um, you know, we're, we're 20 years into the journey now. And, um, it's so wonderful to see my parents be able to come to us and, and be like, if we had known this was an option, we would, we would have done this in a heartbeat like the difference it could have made in your life and your brother's life. And um, like, we, we didn't know. And I, and honestly, I don't think legally there was the option um, when we were very young outside of, you know, certain, you know, religious context, but um, it's just been such a validation to have their um, not just like approval, but their like enthusiastic, love of it and um you know something I think everybody would wish for you know your parents coming to you and and to your husband and to your family and just being like we wish we had done everything that you're doing with our own lives like what a it's probably the highest compliment <laughs> I I could get you know and so it's been um it, a lot of that, a lot of seeing what we've been able to to do and to build, I think, um, you know, my my very good friends know what's happening in in my life right now, and um, you know, I I don't share it really widely, but um, on November fourth here, it'll be a year since my brother has been missing, and um, you know. I, I really like seeing that it's, it's not like, <laughs> I don't want the cautionary tale to be, you know, if you don't homeschool your kids, you know, someday they're going to disappear. That's not what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, this, um, to, to see someone fighting their whole life to be accepted, to find where they belong, to, um, to feel like they were 
a good person just the way that they were um that has to be like my number one goal with raising my own family is you know be as weird as you want and there's nobody who knows weirdness more than we do on the board right <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can't tell everybody how weird we are <laughs> um I don't think we hide it very well. <laughs> we, we really don't. We really don't. So we've got a couple of comments. Um, Audrey wants to know what resources, oh, there we go, have you found to learn the Indigenous language and are you teaching it as well to your children? Oh, yes. Yes, we're learning. Yeah, the whole family's in on it. We, um, I have, uh, I laminate, I, I'm a homeschooler, right? So I have a laminator because of course I do. We laminate every, there's words all over the house. There's, um, you know, um, all of that. Um, the resources that I'm learning from um, are through the um, the Seneca Nation in Allegheny, New York. They have an online um, program for language learners. Um, but there's, um, there's also a program on um, Memrise, M-E-M-R-I-S-E, -E, which is a language learning program, sort of like Duolingo. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think that you, I'm trying to remember, I don't think that you can just put in like Iroquois or Seneca, <laughs> you know, like um, you would need to know like Onondaga Gawainio or, you know, the, the other like technical names for the languages. Um, so if you, if you write to me, um, I'll, I'll be happy to help you find those resources. Um, awesome. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. And Erin uh, is just mentioning that she homeschooled her children as well. And she's a trained Montessorian. And she's very sad to hear that a school, a Montessori school would, you know, treat a child that way. Right. No, we, <laughs> we were the same. I mean, I think it had a lot to do with the area we were in and, you know, um, obviously, I still highly recommend Montessori and, and Waldorf programs to people, to families that I work with. Um, you know, yes, that's it, Shaw. Thank you. Um, um, you know, they. Uh, if if we had to be in a model, that would be the model of education that we would be interested um, in pursuing. And while we don't create recreate it at home like fully. Um, you know, we certainly borrow many, many aspects of it. And um, we have so many, like, they're just so independent and quirky and um, really own who they are. And um, I think that has everything to do with understanding child development, which I think, um, you know, that's that was what first drew me to the Montessori model um, is that it's, you know, very hands-on stuff and very um, pro, uh, you know, child-led learning, which was um, our big thing. And now we've got, you know, we've got an herbalist and we've got an artist and we've got um, our 11-year-old starting his own mushroom farm. Um, you know, the the other the other boy, the 13-year-old, I don't know what he's going to be into yet, but um, I think it might be horses. So I don't know how I'm going to afford horses, but <laughs> something tells me you'll find a way. <laughs> I think we'll find a way. <laughs> so I just, I want to touch on a few other things, you know, before our hour is up. So I was very curious about the, um, the feminine mysteries, rediscovering the feminine mysteries workshops that you had called. Right. Could you tell us a little bit about that? That sounds fascinating. Absolutely. Well, I was um I was teaching um the journey into womanhood courses for um you know girls who were coming into um the age of um cycling and um having such a blast at it and their moms would come to pick them up <laughs> and be like can I take the class? <laughs> and, uh, and then it was sort of like, you know, that's a really great idea. Um, there's no reason that you shouldn't also have a class like this. 
Um, so I hooked up with my friend, um, Catherine, who is an herbalist. Um, she's with Spring Moon Fertility. And, um, you know, really, she has a, a huge emphasis on women's health and, um, and all of that. So, you know, we were like, let's create a curriculum where we discuss the, you know, the changes that are happening in our bodies for, you know, when we um, begin to cycle. And, but then let's also add an element of sexuality. Like, are we using our bodies um, the way in the ways that we want to? Are we having conversations about sex? Are we having conversations about pleasure in ways that um, feel authentic and, um, you know, it's so many of, of, of the women, um, you know, we're expressing, you know, that they, they don't participate in this aspect of sex or that aspect of sex because they didn't know enough about it, or they found it, you know, this way or that way, or it wasn't good for them and they didn't know why and what was wrong with them. And, you know, so being able to have conversations about what the cultural expectations on sex are and how sometimes that's the antithesis to women's pleasure, right? When we're centering narratives that aren't for our bodies, um, we're, we're going to really struggle to find what's good about that. And, um, you know, being someone who was always comfortable having those conversations and could really, um, you know, who who felt really comfortable in um, in their sexuality and what they were experiencing, um, it it really made me. I was so upset when I started to learn how many people were having completely opposite experiences, and. Um, you know, I don't know if we saved everybody's sex life or not, but um, hopefully it's something that they they get to think about that, um, you know, and we haven't done it in a couple of years, you know, like most things, um, you know, um, the past few years. Um, but it's been on the radar because it's something that um, I still feel really passionate about, you know, and and now, you know, I'm counting the minutes until I turn 51 here in a few days. And, you know, while I'm not in menopause right now, um, you know, I want to know more about it. This is another area where we're just not having the conversations. So all of the women, like we're all getting blindsided by our symptoms or the changes, or nobody said that was going to happen or okay, I heard that was going to happen, but it sounded like a ridiculous stereotype, you know, or whatever. So, um, you know, I think the personal experience of knowing that that's something I'm going to be thrust into, um, whether I want to be or not, um, I, I think it's important to have that conversation too. So I would, uh, I would just stick in my two cents here as far as menopause goes, because I'm older than you. But I would highly, highly, highly recommend the book called The Menopausal Years by Susan Weed. Okay. It's been around, it's been around for decades. Um, as soon as I became perimenopausal, this, this book was next to my bed for probably 25 years. Oh, my goodness. And, well, that's quite the recommendation. <laughs> yes. And she, and she comes at it the wise woman way. You know, we're not talking about medication or this or that. We're talking about meditation and right. our plant allies and different rituals that we can do. And I think it would be actually a perfect book for you. And uh, it's purple. <laughs> and it's just, well, that's the thing. everybody calls it the purple book, but it's it's a wonderful book. And I highly recommend it to anyone who is getting there, starting even halfway through, it's just, um, oh, I'm sorry, Audrey, it's called The Menopausal Gears. I think it's for women ages 30 to 99 is the. 
Oh, uh, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that we should be doing having yeah. this conversation yeah. decades and, um, before we need to have it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and the author is Susan, but she spells it S U S U N. Go figure. And her last name is Weed. Like weed. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I would like you pick a book, whether you'd like to talk about your moon book, interact with the children, but I am very interested in your um, reflections on existential gratitude and chronic illness. As someone who's had chronic illness, and I, I know that some of the other sisters have experience with that as well, either with themselves or with someone in right. the family. So, right. So tell us. Well, I mean, you know, the the moon book is, uh, you know, I'll, I'll touch on that briefly. Um, all the artwork is done. All the text is written. Um, what I'm, I'm waiting for is the, the understanding. And, you know, I was thinking about it earlier today, actually. And I think I had, I think I got, I had the download. Um, uh, I had been trying to figure out how to, how would I print a book on the paper that, they come printed on which is that slick paper but then also have a section of the book for artwork and writing because you can't write and and color on that you know that slick paper yeah. and it was like oh my gosh I could just include a link or like a QR code and they can just get the interactive part of it themselves mind blown sometimes we just need like all that time right to like let something um you know ferment because we get stuck in one way of thinking um because I, I couldn't figure out how I was going to print a book with two kinds of pages in it or print a whole book on art paper anyway so <laughs> um my um the the catalyst for the book um is several fold um my brother disappearing is was one of the big catalyst for it um because you know th this idea of like this is it this is our one and only amazing wonderful horrible terrible juicy whatever life this is this is the one right um and so there there was that um but you know the the chronic illness portion of it i've been i experienced um you know an event um and this is one of the early chapters in the book this idea of like we expect like the things that are really going to change our lives to feel bigger to you know isn't there a soundtrack that's supposed to play or something like when the the big moments are about to happen you know but um i was out in this yard raking around this time of year and um i got stung by three ground wasp and um it kicked off this chemical reaction of chaos in me um i had like this huge cytokine storm my um you know like stuff just started going offline <laughs> and i spent literally the next nine months where i couldn't lift my head up above my heart or i would just fall right over <laughs> so you know you know, knowing that, okay, well, this is, you know, dysautonomia, this is POTS, this is, you know, mast cell activation, this is, you know, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, like there was all these ties into all of it. And I was sort of left on my own to figure that out. And, um, you know, so during that nine months of really kind of just laying horizontal, <laughs> you know, um, it was this like this death process really where all I had was what my brain could do and at the journeys that could take and the 
imagination that I could, you know, dream up and dream work and astral work and, um, you know, things like writing and um, connecting in relationship and really having to decide what does a body do, you know, and what constitutes worthiness, value, productivity, what, who deserves to take up space or to ask for things you know I had to really wrestle with all of this and I started um a, a private Facebook page and um and I started just pouring my guts out on it really and um so you know I've got almost a decade's worth of writing on that page and I was like what if you know I sort of collect these and um and see what I come up with and it became it, it sort of wrote itself really um after that you know where I had the bones of it and I had the timeline of it like I'd really done myself a favor <laughs> um keeping such detailed records um that come along with dates and and all of that and um then I, I really hit, I would say earlier this summer, I was just done. I, I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, I'd really, uh, you know, hit this place of like, why, who, who cares? Like, why, why read these stories? Well, how would they matter to anybody? And um, then I was reminded um, of, I had, I had read, um, Kat Duff's book, The Alchemy of Illness, um, which is very similar. It's essays and writings about her time um, as a person with illness. And it changed my life, you know? <laughs> so like the idea, like if, if she had been like, why would I write such a thing? Who cares? Um, I wouldn't have benefited from it. So even if I, you know, it, it's 10 people who read this book, um, that, you know, maybe that's one person who, who learns something or finds something that speaks to them about this experience and, and being validated by it. And um, so, and then I, I've got to tell the story because um, you actually, Morgane, have a role to play and me picking the book back up. <laughs> so, okay, what did I do? <laughs> so two months ago, you interviewed the lovely Christopher Hughes. And it was the first time I had tuned in to um, anything that Christopher has done. I've seen his name. I knew he was a friend of the sisterhood and, and all of that. But I, I didn't know any of his work. And um, during the interview he brought up that, you know, he had written a book 20 years ago and then has a new book and that there's some similar themes. And, you know, this is his book from 20 years ago about who he was 20 years ago. And this is the book now. And something about that just completely threw me wide open. I was like, I don't have to write the perfect book. <laughs> I, it doesn't have to be everything that I want it to be. It doesn't have to tell every story that there is to tell. It doesn't have to have an end because I don't have the end, right? I don't know if I recover from chronic illness. Yeah. I don't know if I find my brother. I don't, I don't know these things. And so this idea that I've been paging up my creativity right? And like beating my wings against the bars of that, you know, bruising myself, harming myself, keeping those stories locked up because I didn't know how they ended. And I wanted to give other people the gift of not having that anxiety, right? They turn the page and the story continues and then you get to an end and whew, I'm glad I didn't have to live 10 years with that feeling but I have had to live with that feeling. So keeping it to myself, I'm, it, it's like this for this weird form of people pleasing, right? Because I'm keeping everybody else safe from the feelings that I'm having. 
right? They won't have the anxiety or the uncertainty until I have the end of the story. And then they can, oh, thank goodness. Oh, it ended well. Or oh, what a tragedy. It ended terribly. Um, but, you know, our stories are never finished being written. You know, I mean, I, and, and this is one of the lessons my brother is also teaching me now, right? This, this contact that I have with him in dreams and in spirit is really, it's really reminding me that we have no idea when these stories end, you know, we have no idea and we, do they ever end? I mean, we don't know. We can't know from this place. So I can, I can put out a book now and it can be exactly what it is. And then I can write another book next year. I can write another book in 20 years. I can write all the books that I want to. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be perfect. And with stories like that, when you're going through something personal, those stories can help someone else go through. It may not be the exact same thing that you've been through, but it may be something similar and it evokes the same emotions and feelings. Right. And I, t I tend to look at things within the circle of the sisterhood and it's like the, you sharing these stories with a woman helping, empowering other women so that they can also know that they can face whatever they're going through. Yeah. Right. And, and and they can they can survive and they can go forward and they can still have a full and wonderful and happy life. So I think it's important to tell those stories. And I'm looking forward to the book coming out. I really am because I, I, I have chronic illness and um, I think that's just a wonderful thing. And I love to hear from other women, especially women that I love and respect to say, you know, how did they get through this compared to, right. you know, how did I get through this? You know, and there might be right. similarities that might be complete differences, but I think it's very important that we all share the stories of our lives, especially in things that, that, that are difficult. And we think we're alone, um, right. along with all my chronic illness. I mean, I had brain cancer and I felt so very alone because it's just me, you know, and there's no control over what is happening to your body. Right. Um, you know, and I did the same. I just kept a journal. It was, and it's only for me and I don't even know where the hell it is now, <laughs> but what helped me is one of my friends who was taking me for radiation every day. She had had cancer. So this was her way of giving back. Right. Me and then telling me her stories and how she dealt with it. And it was, it was helpful and it was profound. And I think telling your stories and putting them out there, that's brave. And that's, that's courageous. It really is because mm -hmm. I mean, you're putting yourself out there. Right, you know, right. <laughs> we know the world and social media is not always the nicest of places. So it's right. a big step because you're putting you. It's not just you're sitting here talking, you're putting your feelings, your heart, your soul on this paper. And you're saying, right. okay, read it. Don't hurt me. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> right. The way, that's the way I look at it. And I yeah. think it's wonderful. I, I think it's great, Justine. I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it. Well, I'm working, uh, you know, on it and, um, you know, it's been, um, it's been one of those things, everybody who sees my astrology chart, um, one of the first things that they ask me is where can I buy your book? <laughs> because I have like every, if there's going to be a writer, it's, it's in that chart. And, um, you know, I've, I've been writing forever and I love the things that I write and, um, you know, I've had some short stories published and, and things of that nature and articles and whatnot. But, um, you know, this concept of, you know, book, it's, it's such a heavy, big word. And, you know, you hear 
the nightmares, right? Oh, God, you know, my family left me while I was writing a book and, you know, and that it was torture and, you know, that it's this like discipline, you know, um, sort of practice that you have to get into. And I'm finding it to be so much more of a devotional project, right? This yeah. going back and reading things, I have so much compassion and love for that version of myself. Like, and now, I mean, I, I talk about this all the time. It's where the, the, the name of my, you know, the, my, my tarot and astrology stuff, the, the quantum cauldron, um, you know, it, it's where that name even comes from this idea that we can visit ourselves quantumly, right. That we can, mm -hmm that the reason I survived the hardships of my childhood or, you know, the, whatever has happened in my life, it's because this awesome version, <laughs> right. Is going back and, and holding those versions, not changing it, not nudging it, not helping it, you know, but just being present and lending a sense of, I don't know why this doesn't make any sense, but I'm hopeful even with everything that's happening, gosh, I'm, I still have a sense of hopefulness. And I know now, and I've known for years, it's because the wiser, older, more experienced, more loving versions of myself are coming to sit next to that version and hold their hand. And like, so I have to remember to do it, right? Like, you know, like at all the, the time, time travel, uh, you know, paradoxes, like, you know, in Bill and Ted, you have to go back and put the keys in the, the bush next to the fire, you know, <laughs> like you have to do these And you things. have to duck down so nobody sees right, you. Right. You know, they're going to catch us. <laughs> I have to do those things, right? Yeah. I have to, I have to read those stories. I have to remember them, even when they're really difficult. And I'm, you know, and I can feel shame or regret or um, embarrassment or, um, you know, deep, deep sorrow and grief over it. Can't believe I did that. I can't believe I behaved that way, you know. Um, and yet I still continued into the version that I am now. So, you know, even those really, really shitty things got me to where I'm at. And thank goodness I've cultivated all of the love and the support and these amazing people in my life right like how when you collect really awesome people it's such a gift like I I don't know how like all the time that I mean and that's where the existential gratitude comes I mean I'm wearing the shirt <laughs> of, <laughs> that, that I made because that's oh, okay how much... so that's, gonna, that's the shirt that goes with the book yeah it's <laughs> it's merch <laughs> <laughs> it's merch. No. that's great we do have um one comment i, I think it's yeah. i can't read i can't wait to read your book justine i suffer with chronic illness spending a year and a half in shock trauma at university of maryland hospital in baltimore mm -hmm. looking forward to the book see that's the thing you tell your stories you touch others right going going through the same thing and i think all of us you were just saying the shitty things that we've done in our lives or why did I act that way? But look at who we are. And if we hadn't done this or that or this, would I be here? Would this be the me? Would this be the version of me? That's right. if one thing had changed, even right. something that, you know, this one moment that changed the course of your whole life, if that hadn't changed, who would I be? I wouldn't be right. me. You wouldn't be who you are right now and I think that's important and you know not since we were you know boasting about the sisterhood I think that's one of the things we do as we're dealing with our shadow and the patterns and stuff that we get stuck in I think Absolutely. it makes it easier to accept the fact that I was a real jerk back then but I learned from that and I'm not that jerk now and I can look at it accept that I was that way and forgive it and let right. it let that part of my shadow just dissipate you know right i i think that's and of course i think pretty much almost everyone here is in the sisterhood so 
Um, you know, so they all know too what the sisterhood mm -hmm. has to offer. Um, right. And it's the perfect time of year yeah. for, for us to, to dive deep, to get in I, that, that, that deep mother earth energy mm -hmm. and, and say, hold me while I look at this, yeah, exactly. this yuck about myself or about the things that I've done. And, and I end up loving myself anyway. Like yeah. that's the work, you know? That's the work. We face it. We look, look at it, face it, confront it. And then we just, you know, um, just integrate all this stuff into ourselves. And we're, we are who we are as a whole. And um, it's beautiful. You know, it's I'm not so grateful for the sisterhood for giving me the, the framework for it. Right. Because floundering around trying to put words or symbols or, you know, a, a comprehension of it. Like, you know, you, you can sniff that you're on the right path with it, but then like to have the framework, right. It just, it's like such a sigh of relief because it's like, this is older and more ancient and more human than anything else I could have devised myself. Right. And, but yet we have complete autonomy within that framework it's just a scaffolding and then we get to like build our personal sacred roundhouse or temple or you know whatever we want to call it <laughs> you know that there are other women and they may not to be doing the same exact thing that you're doing but if you need help or you need support you look and <laughs> right right beside you and they're they're do they're doing the same exact thing you are in their own way Right. So um, I would like to see if anyone has any questions. Um, what is Justine's book title again? Um, to, to Dance in Stargazer Meadow, semicolon, Reflections on Existential Gratitude and Chronic Illness. You can check it. I, I have a, a couple of short excerpts on my Patreon page, um, and Shaw has the the link for that. Mm -hmm. um, Patreon has put it out there. Like you can join a, a page for free now, um, and and get um, the the content that is there. Um, so, um, yeah, I hopefully I'll be doing more updates on there when um things are moving closer to um holding it in in my hands <laughs> and, then when and stargazer else. meadow is um stargazer meadow is one of our meadows here on our land and um it was it was one of the the really low places um i was i i think the 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 journal page might be in all caps for that one. Um, you know, I was just, I was so furious and I was like, you know, is it so hard to just ask, you know, to, to be able to dance in Stargazer Meadow once in a while, you know, and I, and like seeing that like written so big on the page, it was like, wow. Okay. <laughs> like that meant something to me. And now like, you know, being in a place where, um, you know, my healing journey has allowed me to even contemplate that as a reality I might be able to do is like what a quantum leap from where I was at when I wrote that. Um, yeah. And so when the time comes and you hold that book in your hand and you've created it, you've given it birth mm. in the world, we shall have you back. Oh, that'll be lovely. And <laughs> And talk specifically about the book. And um, okay, let's see. Okay, Audrey, not a question, but well, thank you, Audrey. <laughs> yeah, she's. <laughs> so, um, if there's anything else before we before we end for the evening, um, there will be no books, bards, and ballads next month because um, I will be in the process of. A mess. So, um, so we'll in a it's a perfect of mess, though, Morgan. We're happy perfect. for you. <laughs> but, uh, we will be back in a couple of months, and we have some wonderful things coming up for books, bards, and ballads um, 
over the next few months and into the new year. And um, for those of us who are sisters and uh, on the aisle, Oh, we have the Coracle on the aisle. We've got a couple of really, really nice workshops coming up. And as far as Coracle special events, uh, if you haven't done so, please check the SOA page on Facebook. And there's a link, Christopher Hughes will be doing a workshop on the 21st um, on Alina of the Ways. And um, what else? And hopefully we'll have our next uh, Women in Jewelry um, it will be coming the end of February. So there's lots of stuff. Keep a lookout on our SOA page. There's also a Coracle page in there if you want to jump on over to that. And uh, if you have any questions on Coracle, you can write to Sha. Uh, what is it? Sisterhood? No. The Coracle at sisterhoodofavalon.org. And one of us will get back to you. And um, this will be recorded. So for anybody who came in late, and wants to watch from the beginning. It was has been recorded and um, will be posted within a few days on both the SOA and Coracle pages. So Justine, thank you so, so very much for being here. And I'm looking thank you forward so much. to book, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you again when the when the book comes Great. Out. Um, hey, this has been a long time in the making. So um, you know. We, we had to be exactly who we are right now for, for this exactly. two to come together. Yeah. So I'm so glad it did. Yeah. And sometimes the really important things take a while. Right. I mean, the best things. We have children <laughs> nine months and then we have them forever. So that that's a really, <laughs> so it's, it's the same thing. Um, so again, I thank you. I think everyone for joining us uh you've been thank wonderful. you everyone it was so lovely to see um loved ones names pop up and um i really appreciate you thank you so much okay so good night justine good night everyone good night. see you soon <laughs>